You've seen the shocking headlines. This is a case that had so much publicity. But they lived the real life horror. When he had stood up, my dad saw the knife. I said, give up the knife. I couldn't stop screaming. These women stared into the face of unspeakable evil. A man came in with a gun and put it to my neck. I just felt like he was just full of rage. And now they tell their harrowing stories of survival. To save myself, I jumped out of the window. I survived a serial killer. God was giving me a second chance in life. Next. In the summer of 2007, a sweltering heat wave plagued the northeastern United States. That same summer, a ruthless predator known as the Highway Killer began stalking young women. There was nothing known about a possible predator, even though by this point he had killed and he had maimed another person. And that's what made it so scary because it could have happened to anybody. 15-year-old Shay McDonough had no idea danger was lurking. I did not hear anything about a serial killer being on the loose. Until the night Shay woke up and found the killer in her bedroom. I heard a voice and he said, if you make any noise, I'm going to effing kill you. Two weeks before Shay's attack, Darlene Ewalt was trying to beat the Pennsylvania heat. She was out on her outside porch area, was sitting there talking on the telephone when she was attacked violently with a knife and her throat was slit. And the person who was on the other end of the phone heard her gasping uh, for life and, and heard her die. Police arrived and discovered Darlene's lifeless body. They also found her husband upstairs in bed. He's woken up from a sound sleep. He doesn't know what's going on. He sees people in uniform. He sees flashlights and guns drawn pointed at him, and he's terrified. That same terror quickly spread throughout the entire suburb. Darlene lived in a relatively remote area. It wasn't far from a truck stop and from the highway, but certainly it wasn't an area where you expect violent crime. It had everybody on edge, uh, this brutal, brutal knife uh, point murder. Two weeks later, a sleepy town next door in New Jersey was rocked by the murder of 37-year-old Monica Massaro. Monica put the light on and confronted him. She started to scream. He ran to her, put his hand over her mouth. He killed her with the blade. He was holding a knife. She died instantly. There were a number of significant connections between Monica's murder and Darlene's murder. Both were brutal knife point attacks. Both murders occurred at the victim's home, and both were in close proximity to an interstate. What authorities didn't know was the man behind these gruesome murders was a long-haul trucker named Adam Leroy Lane, who prowled neighborhoods near the interstate looking for victims. He was looked upon by his friends and co-workers as somebody who was uh, an angry person, uh, somebody who disliked women. Just one night after killing Monica Massaro, Lane drove north along Highway 495, headed for Chelmsford, Massachusetts. He parked his rig at a truck stop on 495. He started walking through the neighborhoods. Kevin McDonough, his wife Jeannie, and their two kids had lived in Chelmsford for 10 years. The couple's daughter Shay was 15 at the time. We don't have a lot of crime here. I mean, we are next to a bigger city, which tends to have more crime, but not really in this area. July 29th, just a regular, normal day for me. It was a hot day, went to work, came home, and went to bed that evening like any other night. I had come home that night, I want to say it was about a little bit before midnight. After arriving home, Shay didn't bother to lock up. Typically, my brother comes home after me, so I had left the back door unlocked, thinking that he would be in pretty shortly after me. But before Shay's brother arrived, someone else found that unlocked door, Adam Leroy Lane. 
Adam Lane was going around through the backyards. He would try some door handles, and if it was locked, he would move on to try to find one that was open. My bedroom is upstairs. However, that night, I decided to sleep in the guest bedroom because we had an AC unit in there, and it was a lot cooler. Lane entered the McDonough house wearing a mask and black clothing still stained with the blood of his last victim, Monica Massaro. He found Jeannie McDonough's ID and Shay McDonough's high school ID. So he knew that there were women in the house. As Lane prowled the darkened hallway, he discovered Shay asleep in the guest room. He must have walked right by Jeannie's and Kevin's room. The door was open that night and proceeded into uh, the bedroom where Shay was sleeping. I could just feel something cold on my neck. And I opened my eyes and he said, if you make any effing noise, I'm going to kill you. Coming up, Shay fights for her life. He was a really large man and he had his hand over my mouth so I really couldn't make any noises. And later, another teen suffers at the hands of a killer. I will never forget the smell of blood and the sight of it that was in the car. On the night of July 13th, 2007, Adam Leroy Lane, also known as the Highway Killer, found his way into the McDonough family home. It was really only 24 hours after he killed Monica Massaro in New Jersey. 15-year-old Shay had left the door unlocked, waiting for her brother to arrive home. Lane crept in and found the teenager asleep in a guest room. When Adam Lane walked into Shay's bedroom, you know, he had one thing on his mind. It was to kill Shay. I had to make some kind of noise so that my parents would hear me, so I just pushed my back against the bed as much as I could. I mean, he was a really large man, so I didn't really have much wiggle room. He had his hand over my mouth, so I really couldn't make any noises or make any screams, and thankfully, the backboard of my bed was up against the wall of my parents' bedroom, so it knocked into it. I looked at my wife, Jean, I said, uh, is Shay having a nightmare? And she said, uh, I don't think so, but I'll check on her. And I said, well, I'll check on her. And uh, my wife followed me. As I went into the room, I didn't turn the lights on, and I saw a dark silhouette bent over my daughter's bed. The thing that frightened me the most was his mask. And then when he had stood up, my dad saw the knife, and he yelled knife, and he just immediately went over and attacked Lane. I pulled him over my left leg, and I threw him on a bed away from Shay, and kind of did a little spin and got on his back and contained the knife. My mom was right behind him trying to grab a hold of the knife. And while that was all going down, my dad yelled to me, saying, call 911 and get my gun. He got a burst of adrenaline, and he, he got right up off the bed with me on his back. He was much larger. I grabbed my cell phone. I called 911. A man came in with a gun and put it to my mouth. All right, all right, just relax. Is he still there? All right, hold on. All right, all right. Since I was on my cell phone, somehow I had gotten disconnected from the state police. I put a chokehold on him with my left arm and I never let go of the knife. Chelmsford police ended up calling me right back and I was on the phone with the dispatcher until Chelmsford police showed up. Shay kept her composure that evening, which was quite instrumental in getting the police officers there as quick as they they did show up because uh, I, I didn't know how long I would contain this guy. If he had taken me down or got me out, he would have got my wife and my daughter for sure. Officers immediately took Lane into custody. He had two very large hunting knives. One was uh, strapped in a sheath to his leg and he was carrying the other one on his hip. He had a choke wire about three feet long. He had a Chinese throwing star so he was dressed to kill. Equally chilling was a video police discovered when they searched Lane's truck. 
the most prominent item they found was a DVD player in a movie that was inside called Hunting Humans. It's a tutorial about how to kill and get away with it, and Adam Lane must have been studying this to, to learn what he should do to, to commit these crimes and to keep the police off his track. Adam Leroy Lane was evolving as a murderer. He liked this. He wanted to continue, and he would have continued had he not been, been caught in Massachusetts. Authorities arrested Lane and held him without bail. The FBI was contacted by the Chelmsford Police Department, and they suggested that they put Adam Lane's name into a program that the FBI had on file. It's a, basically, it's a database. As Chelmsford police waited for results from the database search, another key piece of evidence linked Lane to the murder of Monica Massaro. They found a receipt for a radar detector that Adam Lane bought just hours after Monica was killed. And the truck stop where it was bought was just down the road from Monica's house. So that receipt, in essence, put him in the vicinity of Monica. So that was enough to get New Jersey to go down and, and, and try to arrange to have a little sit down with uh, Adam Lane to see if he could reveal anything about Monica's death. After hours of questioning by New Jersey police, Lane confessed to Monica's murder. I want to find it look like somebody went in and ravaged her and all that, make it a little better, but it wouldn't look toward me. I wanted to make it look like some, like some maniac sex crime. I cut her in a couple of places. Do you remember where you cut her? Between the legs, on the stomach. Monica Massaro was killed 24 hours before Adam Lane entered the McDonough house, and he was wearing the same exact clothing that he had worn on the attack the night before on Monica. So there was blood DNA on, on all his clothing, and he used the same knife, actually, that he killed Monica with. It was the knife he was holding over Shea, and that was found later on to have Monica's DNA. On another knife belonging to Lane, police found the blood of Darlene Ewald, the Pennsylvania woman who was killed on her back porch. Ultimately, Darlene's DNA on evidence seized in Massachusetts connects the cases absolutely. We were in uh, Chief Murphy's office down at the uh, police station when they broke the news to us that we had a serial killer on our hands that he had killed the night before. My wife and I just looked at each other and disbelief that uh, we were that close to losing our daughter. I'm convinced that Adam Lane was caught relatively early in his career thanks to the McDonough family and that there would have been many other bodies had he not been stopped when he was. Adam Leroy Lane pled guilty to the murders of both Monica Massaro and Darlene Ewald. Adam Lane never really gave any kind of uh, explanation to why he did it, what he was doing. I think he, he was either in denial himself. I didn't mean to hurt nobody. I didn't want to go to jail for the rest of my life. I love my life very much. I ain't out for sexual choice. Did, did you engage in any sexual activity? No. On that night? No. When I found out that Lane was a serial killer, that made me feel awful, because obviously I knew that people weren't as fortunate as I was, and that he had taken lives of innocent women, and it's just not fair. By confessing to his crimes, including the attack on Shay, Lane avoided the death penalty and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Shay has grown up a lot since her life-threatening experience. I didn't realize how much of a toll that it really took on me. Since I was 15 at the time, all of the things that seemed so big at the time just became so small and so petty, and it just made me realize like what's important in life. Zachary, Louisiana is a small, close-knit town just outside Baton Rouge. It is a community where people keep the doors unlocked, able to walk at night down the street. But for one young woman, this quiet town became a living nightmare. For so many years, I was scared to death. I slept with the butcher knife under my pillow. I never turned the lights off. In the spring of 1992, a vicious madman was on the loose in Louisiana. 
The killer's first attack occurred in the heart of Zachary. A local woman named Connie Warner was bludgeoned to death with a hammer. She was a single parent, had a daughter who was a student at Zachary High School here. The night of the murders, it appears that she was at home cross knitting and evidently a knock at the door. She got up and from there it appears that the attack happened in the bedroom. Her body was found down in Baton Rouge, uh, close to the state capital area. Connie Warner, her daughter, went to high school, the same high school that I went to. So I, I remember hearing about it. At the time of Connie Warner's murder, Michelle Chapman was still a carefree 15-year-old. I was a cheerleader. I took all honors courses. I was very outgoing. I was friends with everybody. My motto in life still is live it to the fullest. So that's what I was doing. I just enjoyed life and enjoyed being a teenager. But on the night of April 3rd, 1993, Michelle's life changed forever. It was a rainy night. We had thunderstorms in the area. Michelle spent the evening hanging out with her boyfriend. We ate supper and then we just, we went riding around, listening to music. And um, I had to go to the bathroom. So we stopped there at the cemetery back then, you had no fear of a cemetery. It was just a dark place to go. So I got out the car, I went to the bathroom, I got back in. We didn't lock the doors. We felt that it was a safe place. That's when the passenger backside door opened. Suddenly, a large man burst into the car with a razor-sharp farming blade. I'll never forget his eyes because his eyes were so big and so bloodshot where I just felt like he was just full of rage. He started to attack us. That's when my boyfriend jumped over me and tried to get him away. We were trying to shut the door at the same time. And that's when the knife started attacking my legs. I was trying to fight back to shut the door. He was in the car like this. So his legs were going in and out of the door. So the dome light was blinking on and off. A local cop on his nightly rounds arrived on the scene. I call Officer Eubanks an angel. He just happened to look over and he saw the dome light going on and off. And so he thought something was going on. At the same time, it's storming outside. So the rain is pouring. As Officer Eubanks pulled his cruiser up to the car, the attacker fled into the night. He took off running. And that's when he dropped the knife they found in the ditch. The smell, I will never forget the smell of blood and the sight of it that was in the car. I mean, our flesh is just hanging out everywhere and you just don't even it's it's just it was incredible michelle's right foot was nearly severed during the attack her boyfriend suffered deep cuts to his head and neck but he also survived that night emotionally i was a mess because i was just scared to death and that just from what i experienced and so just from still being scared from what happened um it was just my emotions were were going i couldn't stop screaming but for michelle the nightmare was just beginning coming up michelle's attacker unleashes a reign of terror i thought we had a serial killer on our hands this community was absolutely scared On a stormy night in 1993, 15-year-old Michelle Chapman and her boyfriend barely survived a vicious attack by a maniac. Both appear to be uh, uh, suffered blunt trauma and severe cuts to their bodies. They were very upset, scared, and after interviewing them, we found out that there was a black male who had attacked them. Michelle described her attacker in detail, but cops didn't have much more to go on. The lone piece of evidence that was left behind, the knife, the rain washed away any DNA or fingerprints that might have been on that. So that was a problem for that case. The bigger problem? The town's tiny police department lacked resources to launch a thorough investigation. I became very angry, even at McDavid. I know he was trying to help, but it was still, it's extremely frustrating. With us being a small agency, we're working other cases here besides the murders and, and the deal, narcotics, rapes. I mean, it's just a lot of stuff that was happening here at the time. You know, we didn't have a whole lot uh, of evidence to go on to connect anybody to the case. 
It took a year for Michelle to recover from her injuries. I had to have 200 stitches put into my foot inside and out. So I had to learn how to walk again, which was the hardest task to do in the world. For five frustrating years, there were no breaks in Michelle's case. Then, Zachary police started getting complaints about a prowler. April 1997, we received several calls of a black male in the Oak Shadow subdivisions peeping in the windows. One of the first people police suspected was Derek Todd Lee, a local resident with a long criminal history. I drove in the area. I saw him cross the roadway. And I looked right in his face. He looked at me. He kept running into the wooded area. So what we did was brought in some bloodhounds from the Dixon Correctional Institute. He was able to chase him and corner him up and, and arrest him right there close to where the cemetery was. Lee was charged with lewd conduct, trespassing, and burglary. Derek Todd Lee is a menacing figure. He's big, he's strong, and his eyes are what I remember the most about him. Because when he would look at you, it was like he was piercing through your soul. Lee pled guilty and was sentenced to probation in January 1998. Three months later, Randy Mabrewer vanished from her home. Randy Mabrewer was a single mom, recently divorced. She was a nurse. Uh, she was at home that night. Authorities found Mabrewer's three-year-old son wandering in the yard by himself. When we got to the scene, there was blood splatter, uh, you know, behind the bed. There was drag marks where it appeared that, that she was drugged from the bedroom into the living room. She was appeared to be brought outside where she was loaded into a vehicle and taken away from the scene. To this day, Mabrewer's body has never been found. But her house was just a few doors down from the home where Connie Warner was beaten to death with a hammer six years earlier. What we dealt with in the past, the peeping toms, being seen in the area, the burglary in 1992, I said, you know, we really need to focus on Derek Todd Lee. A search of Lee's home turned up no clues. But McDavid suspected Lee was also the man who attacked Michelle Chapman and her boyfriend. What I did was went back to her case and the other cases to see if I could find enough evidence to get him off the street. What I did was provided a, a photo lineup of six black males with similar features. He said, I need you to pick three people out. And I said, I don't need to pick three people out. This is him right there. Without hesitation, she picked out Derek Todd Lee as the one to attack them in the graveyard. And when I pointed to him, Mick Davis started jumping up and down because he was like, that is Derek Todd Lee. I knew who it was. Mick David thought that he was the one responsible for our attack. The Warner case in Mayburg, there was no force entry into the house. It appears that uh, at Connie Warren's, the keys were taken. At Randy Mubrero's, the keys were taken. In the Michelle Chapman case, the keys were taken out of the vehicle. There was a lot of similarities there that, that really brought these cases together. It seemed authorities had a viable suspect, but there was a problem involving Michelle's case. I start preparing a warrant, uh, getting it together. I bring it downtown, the district attorney's office. She got to looking at the date that the crime happened and looking at the date that we were filing the uh, the arrest warrant and she said, you know, David, the statute of limitations are ran out on this. When I got the phone call that the judge said that it would not hold up in court because of the statute of limitations, I became very angry once again towards that police department. What more do you need when, when somebody identifies their attacker that was in their face? I'm scared to death for my life because this person that I know is so violent and the rage in his eyes and he's out on the streets. Prosecutors couldn't pursue charges against Derek Todd Lee for attacking Michelle and her boyfriend that rainy night in 1993. And police apparently didn't have the resources or expertise to connect Lee to the murders of Connie Warner and Randy Mabrewer. We were looking at him very hard, but back then we were, didn't know a whole lot about DNA. I mean, being a small agency, we never really had a whole lot of training on DNA, didn't have a really understanding of what DNA was about until later on down the line. Derek Todd Lee remained a free man, 
Over the next five years, at least five other women died violently in nearby Baton Rouge. The killer displayed an eerily consistent M.O. He was using his charm, his personality to gain entry into these houses, uh, apartment complexes where he was, you know, stalking these women. Once he found single females with brown hair, very nice looking white females, I think he stayed on that victim the whole time until he saw the opportunity to attack them. Early on, Detective McDavid and law enforcement officials from other jurisdictions shared crime information with the Baton Rouge PD. Still, the murders continued. Our station was the first one to say serial killer. That angered the police because they didn't want that sort of bad publicity. But what it did was it got the feds involved, it got task force formed, it got a lot done by the fact that we were reporting all these horrible crimes that were happening to young, affluent, white females. The FBI task force followed up on dozens of leads, one in particular. They had received some information from a truck driver who saw what appeared to be a white male in a white truck who appeared to have a, a naked female passenger side. Somebody had identified that it was a white man driving, that they thought the body was in there. So then that's when they were fixated that, oh, it's a white male. Based on the description from this, uh, this eyewitness, the FBI came in and do a, did a profile, which basically came back stating a white male who was, you know, kind of withdrawn in his 30s. The feds and Baton Rouge investigators didn't seem to pay much attention to the reports from Zachary. The task force had in their own mind a picture of their suspect. And they weren't willing to listen to Michelle when she pointed out Derek Todd Lee in a lineup because he was a black man and they were looking for a white guy. And that made the entire issue last longer because they weren't willing to bend. Oh, it was all over the news, the newspapers, it was everywhere. Here they're trying to find somebody and and I'm just saying, please just listen. Somebody just listen. Meanwhile, women in nearby Baton Rouge were being raped and murdered. Geraldine DeSoto was one of the more brutal attacks. She was shot with her own gun, stabbed multiple times, and her throat was cut. Charlotte Mary Pace, her murder, it was brutal, it was horrible. This community was absolutely scared. Everybody wanted mace, and they were going out for self-defense courses. In July 2002, the killer struck again. This time, his victim survived. She was able to provide a sketch similar to the one that Michelle Chapman provided uh, back in 1993. Still, the task force maintained they were looking for a Caucasian man. In March 2003, another Baton Rouge woman was raped, beaten, and strangled. She was an LSU student. She was kidnapped and dumped her body in the Whiskey Bay Ridge. That same month, the task force finally announced a change in their suspect profile. They agreed the killer could be African American, as Michelle Chapman had insisted for a decade. With this new development, nearby Zachary police obtained a warrant to collect DNA from Derek Todd Lee. Got signed by a judge in West Shanna Parish. With that signing, we were able to go swab Derek Todd Lee. Three weeks later, the DNA test connected Lee to at least five local murders. A suspect has been identified in the homicides of Gina Green, Charlotte Murray Pace, Pam Kinnamore, Danae Colon, and Carrie Lynn Yoder. Once Derek Todd Lee was identified as the serial killer, the entire country started looking for him. That's because Derek Todd Lee skipped town before the DNA results even came in. He was on America's Most Wanted. He was the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitive. Before long, an anonymous tip led investigators to Atlanta. After surveilling the area for a period of time, Derek Todd Lee was spotted crossing a parking lot at approximately 8.45. They approached him. They asked for identification. Derek Lee produced a uh, identification 
uh, indicating that he was Derek Lee and he was from the state of Louisiana. He was arrested without incident. Knowing that that he was finally, his DNA was connected to them was a sense of relief. I felt like I didn't have to continuously look over my shoulder. The first view that anybody got of Derek Todd Lee was in a Atlanta, Georgia courtroom. And when he came out, he looked directly at the camera. It was kind of strange because that was the first view that anybody in this area had of him after he was captured. And he stared right at the camera. While Lee was a suspect in at least eight murders, prosecutors opted to go with their two strongest cases. The first was for the murder of Geraldine DeSoto. For the Geraldine DeSoto murder, the decision was made to charge Derek Todd Lee with second degree murder. Second degree murder carries a mandatory life sentence in Louisiana. It also is an easier conviction to get. It was about 10 days when he was found guilty. In 04, with Charlotte Murray Pace's murder, the East Baton Rouge Parish Prosecutor's Office decided that they wanted to go for a first degree murder. The trial lasted four weeks. The jury found him guilty and ordered the death penalty. This is a case that had so much publicity and the players involved were so passionate about every bit of it. Every victim, every victim's family member, they put together a great case against him that has withstood all of the appeals process, and he's in jail. He's on death row. It's a relief that he's there and he's locked up, but with our justice system, who knows, he could probably find a way out. Today, Michelle Chapman's physical wounds are healed, but they are still a constant reminder of her fight for survival. I have scars on my ankle and my hands, scars that remind me every day because, again, there's there's no feeling. My ankle has, a, the nerves are damaged, so yes, you know, it does give, it still gives me problems to this day, but I still, every time I look at my scars, it reminds me of what happened. In the years since she faced down a serial killer, Michelle Chapman has become a teacher and a mother. I consider myself a survivor and not a victim. I never saw myself as a victim from him. I saw it as God was giving me a second chance in life because if he wanted me to be gone, I would have been gone that night and I wouldn't have my children and I wouldn't be helping the people that I help today. Coming up, an unsuspecting victim faces pure evil. I don't even remember raping her. But I remember hitting her. I remember there was a lot of blood. July 4th, 2011, Fort Collins, Colorado. 30-year-old wine company executive Lydia Tillman enjoyed a night of fireworks. Area native Travis Forbes also enjoyed the festivities in his own way. When did you start drinking that day? When I woke up. Okay. I had pretty much been drinking every day. That was the first thing I do when I wake up is start drinking. Forbes told police he was so intoxicated he didn't remember how he ended up in Lydia Tillman's apartment later that night. But he remembered what happened next. When you say that you woke up on her floor, where was she? In her bed. Then you got into bed with her? Yeah. And then what did she do? I remember hitting her. I don't even remember raping her. But I remember hitting her. I remember there was a lot of blood. He broke her jaw. He crushed her skull. He poured bleach all over her. And before he left, he set her apartment on fire. Lydia still displays the effects from the stroke she suffered after being savagely beaten that night. Travis Forbes. Um, brutally assaulted me um, in my home, which he set fire to while I was still in there. To save um, myself, I jumped out of the second story window. 
Lydia's fighting spirit even stunned Forbes. I was downstairs when she jumped out the window. I couldn't believe she did that. How'd you know she jumped out the window? Because I saw her. I saw her laying in the back. I was like, holy fuck. Forbes took off into the night, not knowing Lydia's fate. Within minutes, calls came in to 911 operators. 911, what's the emergency? Uh, there's a fire going on. They just kicked the door in and we're screaming for somebody at the top of the stairs. We're just calling for somebody to see if there's in the apartment. She crawls through the bushes. She makes it to the ambulance and she's broken. We zipped down to the hospital. Uh, when we got there, you could not recognize Lydia. There was no way you would know that it was Lydia. What nobody realized was Lydia's battle to survive would soon connect Travis Forbes to the disappearance of Kenya Monhe in nearby Denver. Kenya Monhe was a smart 19-year-old who worked hard and played hard. On April 1, 2011, it was girls' night for Kenya and her friends. They went clubbing in downtown Denver. Her plans were to meet up with um, her normal going out buddies. They were all enjoying the times of their lives. According to her friends, Kenya left the club without them. The next day, she didn't come home. When the full picture started to come into focus, when the friends that she did end up with out that night brought me back her belongings, specifically her purse and cell phone. The last message on her phone was a message from this guy named Travis, and he simply left a message, hi, this is Travis, guy with the white creepy van. The text was from Travis Forbes. Forbes lived in Denver and ran a local business making granola bars. As soon as Tony saw the text, he called Travis, and the two men arranged to meet at the local gas station where Travis claimed he left Kenya the night before. I was very scared. I was thinking in that moment, oh my God, something will happen here. But when he go meet him, the guy, because, Travis, because he, he was having a gun with him. Maria notified police, who were at the scene before Tony arrived. Travis started crying, telling he felt responsible. She didn't make it home okay. Right away after they had gotten that van and left, I told the officer, I said, I told him he did it. And I said, and I said, he did it, man. I said, he just let this guy go. The next day, Denver police brought Travis to the station for questioning. There was a guy, uh, a man that was walking by. She asked him for a cigarette and asked him to uh, sit and smoke with her. And they walked off, and that's it. That was the last, that was it. And I went home. I went to my girlfriend's house. Forbes even told his story to the media. I didn't think she would, she was gonna disappear. We watched the uh, interview that he did with um, Channel 7 that night. Uh, this has been really emotional for me. <laughs> she started hitting him with real hard questions, you know. Did you kidnap her? Did you murder her? I did not. No. He said no, but his head was saying yes. And I was like, I'm like, what just happened? And then he says, what was her name? What's her name? Kenya, yeah. The fact that he pretended not to know her name was just disgusting. I mean, just watching it, it was like, I think that made him even look more guilty. Soon, authorities uncovered security camera footage of Forbes at work, the day after Kenya disappeared. The surveillance video of Travis from the bakery was very eerie. Um, you can see Travis come into the office with big yellow, like, cleaning gloves, which is strange right off the bat. But I think the most disturbing part is that you can actually see him wheel his big ice box basically into the refrigerator and it's all taped up he washed his van with bleach they have no fingerprints they had no body because we didn't have um, a body 
We couldn't say for sure that someone had been murdered. While the investigation dragged on, Forbes headed back to his hometown of Fort Collins on a violent collision course with Lydia Tillman. I knew that he's going to go out and do something again. I just knew that if he did it once, he's going to do it again. On July 4th, 2011, a chilling story hit the news. 30-year-old Lydia Tillman was brutally assaulted. I heard about the attack on Lydia. I just knew that there was a fire, that someone had attacked a woman, set a fire, and she jumped out the window to save her life. Investigators soon linked the vicious assault against Lydia Tillman to the search for Tony's missing stepdaughter, Kenya. While fighting him, Lydia scratched him or somehow got his DNA under her fingernails. A Fort Collins deputy DA recalled Travis Forbes' suspected ties to the disappearance of Kenya Monhe. So when that case happened with Lydia, he said, you know, you guys should really look into this guy in Denver. So the detectives, once they figured out that there may be a connection, we sent some of our DNA samples up to their lab that they were using. While Fort Collins authorities waited to see if the samples matched, they kept close watch on their suspect. Travis Forbes was hitting the Fort Collins club scene. Fearing there would be a third victim, police stepped in. Police are questioning him because he is um, acting up. He's acting like a drunk person. And they ask for his name, and he gives a fake name. Police arrested Forbes for making a false report. While he was in custody, the DNA results came in from Denver. They were a match. That's where they got the DNA of Travis Forbes under Lydia's fingernails. Um, tough. Tough. <laughs> Lydia's tough. Now certain that Travis Forbes was the attacker, police charged him with the attempted murder of Lydia Tillman. When I got the call from the district attorney's office that Travis had been arrested for these crimes up in Fort Collins, I immediately fired an email. And it's like, make a deal. Make any deal. We don't care what it is. We just want to know where Kenya is. We had worked out this deal with Travis Forbes, and it was two-part. The deal was that if he showed us where Kenya's body was and gave a full statement of what happened to her, then we would not seek the death penalty. And he would plead to a charge in Fort Collins that was attempted murder and not a sex assault. He didn't want to go to prison and be a sex offender. Do you have your hands around her neck? I don't know. Okay. Did you think that's what you did? I either killed her by strangulation or killed her by snapping her neck. How long do you think you dug for? It wasn't very long. I was actually surprised. I was worried that it was so late that I wouldn't have enough time. I dug that hole fast. I left my credit card inside the hole. Why did you do that? It was not that I wanted to get caught. It wasn't like I was trying to brag that I did it. Because I knew that if it was ever going to be found, holy shit, dead body. Those credit cards have embroidered lettering on them. I just figured it was right. I figured that if you found the body, that I should be caught. We drove up there and sure enough, he ended up taking us to this ravine and he stood and he pointed out where she was to everybody. And then he went back to the truck and he sat down on the ground and he put his head in his hands and cried. It was later that day where they called us downtown and, uh, and they informed us then that uh, this is the deal we made, that he will plead to uh, first-degree murder, and we won't seek the death penalty. And he has traded death for life in prison without parole. Months after being sentenced for killing Kenya Monhe, Forbes faced sentencing for attacking Lydia Tillman. Lydia endured multiple surgeries and intense rehabilitation prior to attending the hearing. Lydia's father shares the statement he read in court on Lydia's behalf. It was my intention to find the strength in my heart to forgive Travis Forbes. I did. I am happy as I've ever been. Yes. I hope to live my days happy. inspired anew 
I will be in peace. Peace. And my goal, I want to be more patient with myself. Yes. Lydia Tillman is really, I think, the hero of all of this. And she's got to be one of the strongest people that I've ever seen. She stood up and was able to communicate with her dad's help and forgave him. I think everyone in the entire courtroom cried. It's hot on the path. Today, Lydia is still working to regain her health and ability to speak, but she holds no ill will toward the man who tried to kill her. Travis um, Forbes, you caused me no harm. My spirit and um, my mind remain untouched. May you find peace in this life.